Coming up, I check out the Kempston Disk Interface. I play some games. I chat to Jeff. And end with a typing. Let's get on then. In episode 115, I reviewed, after a lot of turmoil, the Watford Electronics SP-DOS disk interface. At the end of that review, I said that the interface was later taken over by Kempston Electronics, improvements added and then sold as the Kempston disk interface. The improvements included no boot disk requirements, all commands are now in a ROM, less memory used for the operating system, only 700 bytes, a copy command included to transfer tapes to disk, and a compressor for basic programs. Here then is the Kempston disk interface, released around summer 1985. The first advert had a cool looking setup, with twin black disk drives, something I sadly can't replicate. The second advert looked much more business-like, showing the interface and listing the features. The interface itself is about the size of a joystick interface, so Kempston seemed to have redesigned it. On top is a connector for the disk cable, a light to show that it's on, and a reset button. The features listed in the advert included compatibility with three, three and a half and five and a quarter inch disk drives, both single and double sided, and up to four drives are supported. The interface also uses Sinclair's built-in commands like format, cat and save. Although the interface was expensive, you still needed a disk drive and they could cost around £185 for a single sided unit, so this upgrade would not be something to take lightly. Setting it up is easy. You get yourself a decent disk drive. The ones for the BBC Micro are ideal, but quite expensive on eBay. Get the right cable, plug the interface into your Spectrum, turn everything on, and you're ready to go. If all goes well, you should see the copyright notice and ROM version shown on screen. Now, because unlike the SPDOS interface, you don't need a boot disk, all commands are included in the interface ROM and link into the Sinclair basic commands. So the first thing we need to do is format a disk. And the format command is quite complex and consists of several parts, just like the SPDOS. First, the basic overlay, which is print hash four. And every command you use with this interface, you need to prefix with that. Then the Sinclair format command, followed by the name of the disk, then a colon, and then print, and then four numbers. The first is the number of the disk drive from one to four, then the number of tracks, 40 or 80, then the number of sides, one or two, and then the step rate, one, two, three or four, representing a step rate of six, 12, 20 or 30 milliseconds. I tested this on 40 track disks, and when using double sided, I got 400K of storage. Using the cat command, you can see the details of the disk. The formatting seemed much quicker than the SPDOS for me, and it wasn't long before I had a few disks ready to test. I'll write a little basic program, save it to the disk using the basic overlay command of print hash four followed by save and the file name. And the cat shows that it's there. A reset, a load, and yes, it's back. So no problems at all. Other commands include erase, which uh, deletes a file, and move, which renames a file. A bit confusing, but once you get used to it, it's fine. One interesting thought was, could this read disks formatted using the SPDOS interface? I had already set a boot disk up for that review, so I slotted it in, hit run, and yes, it loads the boot menu fine, and loads the games. To make something auto run, you save it out with the name of auto, and set the line number to execute first, just like a normal basic program. Then when you press reset, the interface will look for that file and load it. The other important feature missing from the SPDOS version was the copy command. This was added by Kempston and allows you to copy tapes to disk. Now, I'm not expecting great things from this, but I'll give it a try with a few early games and see how it works. First, let's try one of my basic games it contains a small chunk of code for user-definable graphics, a loading screen, and the main code, which runs in at 29k. The command is print hash four, copy. You are now asked to start the tape, and it loads the first part, it then tells you to stop the tape, it writes to disk, and loads the next part, and continues on.
When it gets to the end though, it didn't ask me to stop, which was odd until I read the manual. And what this actually is, is a batch copier. It will take the contents of a file loaded from tape and copy it straight to disk, which is fair enough, I suppose. When I tried to load the program back, it didn't work. It hadn't actually converted the loader to work with the disk. So again, this is a bit of a letdown. I was hoping that it would convert the loader to load the files that it expected to load and save to disk, but it didn't. This means you have to go into the files and modify all the syntax to make it work with the disk interface. Eventually, I got it working with my basic program. However, there is one small strange thing, and that's you can't have multiple commands in the same line. So I had to split out each of the loads separately. Next, I tried an early commercial game, Escape from New Generation. Now this has just two parts, a basic loader and a machine code file. Now both were copied to disk without a problem, but again, it didn't convert the loader. Having changed the loader to work with the disk commands, it still failed, which was a bit strange because the one I used for testing the SPDOS worked fine, even with this interface. Then I tried 3D Death Chase, went through all the motions of stopping and starting the tape and saving the code to disk, but alas, it didn't work. I can see how this could be useful if you have a lot of your own programs saved to tape and you wanted to convert them in one long session, which is fine. But for commercial games, not a chance. Unless they were written in 1982. And even then, it's probably 50-50 whether they'll work. One last feature, the compressor. Now this turns all of the numbers in a basic program to their val equivalents, saving three bytes per number and also changing zeros, ones and threes into notpy, signpy and intpy, saving five bytes per instance. Allegedly, this can save quite a lot of memory for a decent sized program. Let's go back to my old basic program then, which runs in at 29K. To use this utility, we first load the basic program, luckily already on disk, and then enter print hash four clear zero. You then get a countdown as it goes through each line and does the conversion. And this takes a very long time, especially for large programs. Right, it's done, so I save it to disk and do a cat. And the end result is a file running in at 24k. Now that's not bad at all, is it? Saving quite a chunk of memory there, with no issues when running either. A very good tool for those conscious of memory space. What about speed though? Using my default speed test game, The Birds and the Bees, this 32K game loaded in about 5.5 seconds to 6.5 seconds. I was a little slow on stopping my phone stopwatch, but if you freeze frame, you'll be able to see the correct time. On average across all speed tests then, I would rate this at 6.5 seconds. Overall though, it's a mixed bag. I love the interface, how it works, how easy it is, but as with the SPDOS and other third party storage devices, it's only as good as the support it gets from software suppliers. As far as I know, no games or utilities were released specifically for this interface, which is a shame because the Spectrum was crying out for a storage standard. Obviously the price was a huge barrier as well. The Kempston disk interface I'm very impressed with. I can easily have seen this being used by small businesses or software developers. It's fast, uses standard disk drives and is fairly easy to use. Sadly, the price meant it was out of the range of the average users. And without an easy option to transfer games, especially ones that arrived in late 83 onwards that used non-standard loaders, it would render it of little use to the average gamer. Roadrunner was an odd game for arcades. Released in 1985 by Atari, you control the Roadrunner, trying to avoid Wily Coyote. The game involves running left to right, eating seed and avoiding Wily in his various attempts to catch you. The seed is very important. Miss a few, then Roadrunner goes dizzy and gets caught by Wily. But the control mechanism is terrible. You can only switch lanes and switch directions, rather than having full movement. I could not get used to this at all, as you can see. The game was converted and released for the Spectrum in 1987 by US Gold. Mine was originally purchased from WH Smith at a cost of $8.99, and it came with this interesting little bit of paper. Hmm, programming difficulties, eh? That doesn't sound good. After 
a nice little intro and music, we get onto the game, and it's a very colourful screen. Sadly, the main action only takes place in about a third of this, and it's limited to monochrome. The screen is also reduced by graphic panels on each side, so the playing area is quite small. The game mimics the arcade version, but at least in this game you have free movement. But then again, this does not improve gameplay, in fact, it makes it worse. The collision detection is very hit and miss, and you can walk through and over bits of seed and not pick them up. How was this not picked up during playtesting? It makes the game so frustrating. One of the most important parts of the game, and the thing you need to keep doing, is flawed by design. After a few minutes I was just ready to reset the machine. Just so annoying. Wily Coyote gets various other transport assistance from things like pogo sticks and rockets. But you're too busy trying to pick up more seed rather than taking any notice. Missing the seed means you have to double back and risk getting caught by him coming the other way or try to outmaneuver him. Which, strangely, has overkeen collision detection, the complete opposite of the C collection. And you often get caught when, judging by the graphics at least, you're a good enough distance away. The great music and cartoon sound effects from the arcade are mostly missing. Replaced not by an AY soundtrack, but by a beeper music effect. You do get the beep beep of Roadrunner now and again, which works well I suppose. There are different levels, but to see them I had to use a poke. If I thought the first part of the level was frustrating, when I got to the end it just doubled again. And you have to navigate through narrow paths, and you keep getting stuck on scenery. This is a theme that continues on many other levels too. The second level turns this up to 11, with a dash through more narrow paths, some ending in dead ends. This is where you need a map, otherwise frustration levels will go through the roof. Level 4? Well, you get red stuff on the road that just makes it even more annoying. What the hell is it anyway? Sometimes you get stuck, sometimes you don't. This game is, for me, unplayable, even with infinite lives. I know they were trying to replicate the arcade version, but there needed to be more leeway and a bit more playability. This is for home micros and it's not designed to collect coins. One to keep away from then, and I wish I had done. This is Cobra Force, released by players in 1989. Good horizontal shoot 'em ups are quite a rarity on the spectrum, so I had high hopes for this one. A game late in the spectrum's life, and the screenshots looked impressive. After picking your control method, it's off in your Super Cobra helicopter, fighting across four levels. The landscape is very colourful and detailed, and scrolls really smoothly. The control is good, and this reminds me a little bit of Blood Money on the Amiga. To fire missiles, you hold down the fire key, which is easy enough, but you can sometimes fire missiles in the heat of battle when you didn't really want to, and you do have a limited supply. You start with a machine gun, but you soon pick up bombs and missiles as you go, usually by taking out formations of enemy fighters. This though is tricky, with so much stuff flying around the screen. Missiles are needed to take out some of the gun emplacements. You can also pick up outriders, sadly they are lost when you complete a level. You also have a freeze weapon, and this freezes everything on screen, which is useful for getting out of trouble, but you only have a limited number of these. To complete a level, you have to destroy all the enemy emplacements and collect all of the barrels. Once this is done, two huge helicopters appear as end of level bosses. Once you destroy these, it's on to the next level. Although the graphics are great, the sound is a bit of a letdown. Very tinny and quiet. This is a shoot 'em up. There should be loud bangs and explosions everywhere. Gameplay, I thought, was forgiving and lets you get far enough into the game, 
but soon realised it was very difficult indeed. Because you have limited firepower initially, there's a lot of things firing back at you. It's only when you get outriders and missiles does it become a little bit easier. Often I never got that far. I only managed to get to the end of level 1 once, and that was by sheer accident. I just flew around the level to get enough missiles to destroy all of the enemy guns, and then died. The other levels get progressively harder, with different scenery and more turrets and enemy ships to shoot. To see those, though, I had to use a poke. The enemy are sometimes hard to avoid, and although you think you're doing well, you often ignore your shields. You can pick up extra shields, again dropped by enemy fighters if you shoot enough of them, however they sometimes drop behind scenery, making them impossible to get. I like this game, when using a poke, and I would have liked it to have better sound, and a little less difficulty, but it plays really well, and if you're a shoot 'em up fan, certainly give it a try. So today, Paul, we're going to talk about frustrating games. Frustrating and annoying games, which is probably the same thing, isn't it, really? Can I kick off? Yeah, go for it, yeah. Underworld. Underworld? Oh, that's going to be controversial, but I totally agree. I can't play that game. The The jump mechanic is terrible. You just bounce off things. Yeah, you bounce all over. Some There are some jumps that you've got to get kind of just right. The bouncing around all over is really annoying. And then there's the bubbles. Yeah. And getting right. bounced off the bubbles. Yep, and then there's the rope. Yep, and having a great big stalactite come down and smash you in the back <laughs> while you're on the rope. Yes, it's just... And then, once you get past the, one of the first two guardians, there are eagles that come and pick you up and just take you off and randomly drop you. I would definitely put my vote in for Underworld. I'm sure there's a good game underneath there. Some people definitely seem to like Underworld, but no, it's not for me. So for my game, I'm going to go with something we've played before, which is Jungle Fever. Not Jungle Trouble. Jungle Fever is the one which is a uh, multi-screen game, and the second screen has a rope swing that, that neither of us could do. Didn't I do it? Didn't we work out how to do it in the end? And we, might, we were Probably, getting past it. But it was just, that, was, that, that has to be annoying, surely. It was. But the funny thing is, Jungle Trouble's annoying. And, and Jungle Tr Trouble is annoying, yeah. The, the crocodiles, the, the you have to stop to jump, and, and the monkeys keep chasing you, and you can't slap them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you can, but it's really hard. Oh, I'm going to have to say Jack and the Beanstalk. Oh, another one that we played together. Yes, I, I, I can't even get up the Beanstalk, but you, you got quite far with that, but as uh, coming to that for I've the first com time... I've completed it, but it's incredibly difficult. It's really frustrating, because you just can't see where you can go and where you can't go. I know, so that, and I don't think I ever got past the first screen at all. At least the beanstalk gives you some uh, some idea of where to go. On the next one where you have bricks that you've got to climb up the side of. Some you can, some you can't, some you've got to jump over, some you don't. It's a nightmare! <laughs> so my next one then, Hunchback from Ocean. Yeah, the second screen. The second screen, the rope screen. A bit like the second screen on Jungle Fever. It's the same sort of thing, there's a rope that you just can't get onto. And when you do, you're normally on your last life. Yeah. Definitely going to be uh, up in there amongst the frustrating games. There is a theme emerging with your games in that anything to do with jumping on a rope seems to <laughs> be frustrating to you, Paul. So the next one's going to be Jet Set Willy then. <laughs> <laughs> is it? No. It's yours next anyway. Wanted Monty Moore. The crushers are random. The random crushers? The random Very, crushers. The, the game itself is good and... Everything is good. Uh, apart from those random crushes is good, but having those, yeah, th yeah, you can't even time it. You no idea when it's going to happen. It's just you, you either die or you don't. In fact, I think I'll add Alvidas in Monday in as well. In that, at the start, you're asked to pick from your escape kit. I think you've got to pick four or five things, and if you get them wrong, that's it. You can't complete the game. That, that's bad game design, though, isn't it? But I suppose that will lead to frustration. The Hobbit could be frustrating because it was possible that off-screen, as it were, some characters would be killed that meant you couldn't complete the game. 
Yeah, I suppose so. Not thought about The Hobbit at all, but yeah, could see how that was frustrating if you got all the way to the end and found that, you know, Bard has been killed by somebody, so you couldn't kill Smog and get the gold. Yeah. When things happen that are kind of out of your control or you don't know what you're supposed to do, that that definitely frustrates. That's just... <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, I'm going to go with the final game, which is Jasper by Micromega. Jasper. And that's another platform game that's really difficult to control and judge and uh, the collision detection isn't where it should be and it, I just find it impossible. It looks beautiful though, doesn't it? It looks very good and I think that they did put screenshots in the adverts but I think a lot of companies Why made games that? to look good. That, and it, that also Jack goes for things like Jack and the Beanstalk. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. Good. Yeah, they made the, the screenshot look excellent and then pro they probably made the screenshots and thought, how can we make a game out of this? Mm. <laughs> If you've got any games that you think are really annoying or frustrating, why not inflict them on Paul and I, and we will try playing them at City Connection was an arcade game released in 1985 by Jellico. It took the platform idea, the driving idea and Qbert and merged them together into a fun challenging game. You control a car driving on different platforms, you can jump up and down between them and turn around. There is a story about a love struck teenager in search of her man being pursued by police, but let's not get into that. The Spectrum version was released in 1988, but the actual tape is missing in action. There was an improved 1 to 8K version that was sent to magazines, but this never materialised as a full game. Well, at least until now. The contents of the demo were recovered and completed to make a final release over 20 years since it first appeared. Here then is City Connection 1 to 8. There's a nice intro with AY music before we get into the game. You travel around the world, depicted by various backdrops, and to complete a level and move on, you have to change the ground to a different colour, avoiding the chasing police at the same time. Staying close to the original, with nice graphics and control, the game is fun to play, but like the arcade, can become very challenging. Congratulations! You can knock off the other cars chasing you, but to do that you need to shoot them first, and you have limited shots. You can collect more in the shape of oil cans that randomly appear. The jump control is tricky to get used to, but once you do, the game soon becomes much more fun. Sound is used really well, with some nice music playing throughout the levels, and good spot effects. Each level has its own tune, and they don't distract from the gameplay at all. Watch out for the cat with a flag though, don't hit that. <coughs> the graphics mimic the arcade, but only in monochrome. Later levels have bands of colour, but I couldn't get that far. I'm sure with more practice I could though, and the game is never frustrating. The platforms and background scroll really smoothly, and this is a very polished game. Highly recommended then. This is Firehawks, released by Post and Software in 1984. I think we can all guess what type of game this is going to be, and you'll be disappointed. The introduction even mentions the Phoenix, so are we all expecting a Phoenix style game then? Hmm, okay. There are rows of shields across the screen, in different patterns, and above them are the Firehawks. You have to destroy all of them before any of them reach the bottom of the screen. The hawks can destroy some parts of the shield 
but you have to shoot holes in them anyway to get to the hawks. The graphics are chunky and move in 8 pixel jumps, which in this game is really noticeable. The player ship also moves this way, but it's made worse by the seemingly key repeat key kicking in, sending the player ship flying across the screen at an uncontrollable speed. And this makes lining up shots sometimes impossible. The sound is very annoying, as you can probably tell, and it just makes my ears hurt. If one of the hawks does reach the bottom of the screen, a phoenix appears in a line drawn format, and the game is over. You only get one life here. If you do destroy all the hawks, well, it took me a long time to manage it, but you get another level with differently placed shields. Quite by accident I found the key to this game, and that is to find the place where the hawks regenerate. You sit there and just zap them as they appear. This will leave a few left on screen, but they don't really do much, so you can then move along and complete the level. It's still a poor game though, and one I would steer clear of, or at least put some earbuds in while you're playing. He-Man was a type-in that was published in Micro Adventurer in December 1983. It was written by Robert Permain, who contacted me some time ago and asked me if I had time could I type it out and provide it to him in a tap file. This I did, and he kindly agreed to let me make it available on the show. This was quite a while ago, and I've only just come across it again recently whilst upgrading my computer. You play He-Man in this adventure game, faced with a formidable task, so the story goes. Not all of this is true, as Robert himself admits. Running the game, you are shown a set of stats, including strength, enemies left and magic left. You are captured and thrown into the arena of death, but all you can do from this point on is press enter. This will trigger some random numbers to be generated, which will decide if you hit or get hit by one of the enemies. This is repeated until you are dead or you win, it's not really an adventure game, it's more of a random number generator, really. I can't find anywhere in the game that the magic is used, and the phrase you have the power means that you've got the sword, but the sword is always set to value of 1, and you never lose it. This is the first time it's been seen in over 30 years, and my thanks to Robert for allowing me to make it available. You can grab it from my website shortly.